Good morning, everyone. You seem bright-eyed. Despite all the fun that was being had last night, it looks like you slept well and you've got some coffee in you. That's wonderful. I hope everybody had a great time yesterday, and welcome to day two. If the decibel level of the street fair was any indication, I think there's a lot of magic happening and a lot of connections being made. We have another wonderful day ahead for you. We have a conversation this morning about change. We have another cornucopia of concurrent sessions. Say that three times fast. We have CFPB Director Richard Cordray joining us at lunch before we pivot to advocacy and Hill visits. And we've got another fun evening in store. And Kristen will share details on that at the end of the plenary. You know, if yesterday was about where our field has been and where we're going, then today, culminating in the Hill visits this afternoon, is about taking action and making change. And yesterday morning, you heard Andrea's three charges to the field to flip the tax code, to rebuild the opportunity economy, and to close the racial wealth divide. And you know, that last part, I just want to say there are so many people, organizations, funders, researchers who have been thinking about that last bit for years and years. Uh, and the engagement at the conference has been extraordinary in this issue. That conversation continued yesterday, not just at the lunch plenary, but in multiple concurrent sessions, and even before the conference started at pre-conference sessions. And so as I was thinking about um, Andrea's charges in the context of this morning's conversation about change, I want to offer just two examples that relate to the theme of change making this morning. The Asset Building Policy Network, which has been uh, in action for six years with the support of City, has, has been talking about this for a long time and held a half-day pre-conference before we got together yesterday to talk about the drivers of the racial wealth gap and how financial institutions and community groups and advocates can come together and move the needle. We also had powerful pre-conference conversations with a group of policy advocates that have been convened by the Northwest Area Foundation in the northwestern part of the country about the ways that we can advance policies to support financial well-being. We had a really amazing conversation about Native communities and the ways that the environment and DAPL and Standing Rock, as we heard yesterday, connect to our work to build financial well-being for all. And those are just a couple of, the, of examples of the places where we are seeing change happen through partnership across the nonprofit sector, the public sector, the corporate and philanthropic sectors. We are so grateful for all that you all are doing in this space, not just for the work that it allows CFED to be involved in, but more importantly for the work it, involve, it allows all of you to do. So now we move to today. And to start us off, I wanted to offer a few thoughts to prime the pump for the speakers that we are about to hear. Um, I will tell you that my colleagues at CFED can testify to the fact that one of my special joys in life is to see how many metaphors I can mix into a single conversation. So this morning, I'm going to give you three, because Andrea likes things in threes, uh, ships and fish and pebbles. And I know that sounds a little weird, so stay with me. I promise we will get there. Thinking about change, there are a lot of changes that we as a field would like to make. We'd like to change policies that don't do enough to create opportunity or that actually actively quell opportunity. We'd like to change the systems that are so hard for people to navigate, sometimes intentionally hard. We'd like to change products and services that only serve some of us and leave the rest of us behind, and prejudices and predators that undercut all the important work that we are all doing to build an opportunity economy for all. So I've been thinking a lot lately about how change happens. And this morning, you're going to hear from a number of powerful leaders, people far wiser than I on this subject, who are going to talk about how they have personally advanced change on a range of levels and what they see as essential for us as a field to do together. But I'll just preface their remarks by saying that change happens in a lot of ways. Sometimes it happens from the top down, and sometimes it happens from the ground up. Change from the top down can feel daunting. I mean, really, we, we follow the headlines, we see the tweets. How do we persuade decision makers at the top, senators and representatives, mayors, agency heads, whoever that might be, to come together across the aisle on even the most common sense of issues? How do we navigate the intricacies of bureaucracy? It can feel really intractable. 
You know, my first job out of college was with a, an anti-poverty grassroots lobbying group called Results, and my colleague Meredith <laughs> Dawson is in the room today. And at Results, we often talked about the notion of the trim tab. This is an idea that was sort of originated by the inventor and visionary Buckminster Fuller. So what's a trim tab? Think about changing the course of a ship, a huge ship. You can push on it all you want. Nothing is going to happen. You turn a ship like this by turning the rudder on the back. You turn the rudder, you turn the ship. But on a ship of that size, even the rudder is enormous. How do you even move the rudder? Well, on that rudder is a much smaller rudder. It's called a trim tab. If you can find and turn that trim tab, then you can turn the rudder. And if you do that, then you turn the whole ship, the ship of state, as Buckminster Fuller said. So in making change from the top down, part of our task is to find those trim tabs, the people and platforms and moments that affect how decisions get made. And if we can find and influence them, then we begin to turn the rudder and the whole ship. And sometimes change happens from the ground up. So my metaphor here is a reflection of the fact that I have an almost three-year-old at home who loves to read. And in one of her favorite books, Swimmy, a school of little fish wants to go explore the ocean, but they can't because they're so small that if they do, the big fish will eat them up. But you can't just lie there, says Swimmy. We have to think of something. Swimmy thought and thought and thought. Then suddenly he said, I have it. We are going to swim all together like the biggest fish in the sea. And they do. So that's about one voice and then a group of voices calling for change. It's about people and organizations coming together in community and coalition to create something that's bigger than any one person or any one organization. It's the work you're doing at home with your partners. It's why we at CFED are so honored to support the networks of which many of you are already members, the Assets and Opportunity Network, the Taxpayer Opportunity Network, the I'm Home Network, the Campaign for Every Kid's Future, or any of the other many formal and informal networks that we can support. We're privileged to be part of bringing your voices together, which represent, as you heard yesterday, many thousands of people and organizations. And it's why we hope that every one of you, if you're not already a member of one of our networks, will consider joining so we can swim together. And finally, whether it happens from the top down or the ground up or both at once, change can be hard. Change can be slow. And the fact is that it doesn't usually happen overnight. Do you remember, and yes, this is my third metaphor, Aesop's fable about the crow and the pitcher. The crow is dying of thirst, and then finds a pitcher with a little bit of water at the bottom. But try as he might, that crow's beak just can't reach the water all the way at the bottom of that pitcher, so he takes a pebble in his beak, and he drops it in. And another pebble, and another, and another, until finally the water rises high enough for him to drink. The change we want to see does not usually happen in the blink of an eye. It's the result of many pebbles getting dropped into that pitcher one by one by each one of us in this room and all those who are not here today. That water, the opportunity that we want for every person in this country is getting closer to the brim because of you. And all those, again, who aren't here, and all the people and families who we serve. Howard Zinn, the historian and activist, said it well. We don't have to engage in grand, heroic actions to participate in the process of change. Small acts, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform the world. And we think we're on the right track. During the past few decades and the past few years, the community of people and organizations who care about these issues has grown exponentially. Not only are we reimagining how we see our own field, we're also expanding the fields that see themselves reflected in ours. My colleague Kate Griffin will talk more about this in tomorrow morning's plenary on building bridges. Good metaphor, Kate. And as you heard yesterday, our issues have never been more prominent and our numbers have never been larger. And this afternoon, in the perfect example of change making, Nearly 600 of you are going to make your way to Capitol Hill, rain or no rain, to make your voices heard. Yeah. So this afternoon and in all the days and the years to come, let's keep making change together. 
let's keep swimming together like one big fish and finding those trim tabs and dropping the pebbles into the water one by one. Thank you. <laughs>